how have you had to change yourself from the beginning of your journey until now? I think I there was a lot more arrogance I had before that I had to turn into humility over time because and it's really interesting because you think you know you've done it once the second time would be easier and the third time would be even easier but it's never that way uh, every product is different every market is different every time in the industry is different so so you're constantly having to evolve yourself but i think the the realization that it's all about having a learning mindset and growth mindset uh, i've i've had a lot more over the years and and, and i feel like that um, that that's one big change i can i can see myself Vikram Chalana is the founder and CEO of Pictory, an AI tool that converts long-form content and such as blogs and webinars into a month's worth of engaging visual and social media content all in a matter of minutes. Vikram has spent a long time working in AI, and this is his third company to date. I wanted to talk with him because AI is changing so much of the world, and for someone who's spent for someone who spent so much time in the industry, I wanted to hear from him. What are the hardest things about AI? What are the strangest things about AI? Is he afraid of AI? What do you think the future of AI looks like? How his business is using AI? But then we also went into his psychology and what made him want to be an AI. How he sees himself in his businesses how he's had to change himself in order to keep running these businesses, what he thinks VC can, uh, how he thinks VC should be changed, how he's changed himself, and so much more. So I know you're going to love this conversation. Let's enjoy it now. So your company uses AI to help people with content marketing. Is this meant to take away from people's jobs or to augment people's jobs? I think of AI as an assistant, assisted intelligence, not uh, artificial or augmented intelligence. So I think of this as, as really helping people with productivity, improve improvements, and, uh, and just taking some of the routine stuff out of your, uh, out of your plate. It's all about augmenting, helping. I, I agree. I think that should be the focus of how AI evolves. And I don't mean evolve as like it's going to become a robot and kill us. Evolve in terms of how it's used. I think one of the biggest problems we see now is that companies are trying to get rid of humans by implementing AI, where there's so much work that needs human input that you really can't replace an AI with a human, but having an AI can help the human do a better job. A lot of people say, Oh, we're going to replace lawyers and doctors. Well, probably not. I mean, sure. The AI can go through all the legal files and all of the statutes and, or all of the, you know, images of cancer versus not cancer, et cetera. There's all sorts of things that AI can do that a human just doesn't have the time to do. But, at the end of the day, you still need a human to really perform a lot of the functions. Like an AI doesn't have bedside manner. <laughs> Not to say humans are great at it either, but some of them are. What made you want to get into AI? I have been in AI for a really long time. I have been in AI for over 30 years now. My When I was in school, I got exposed to something called neural networks way back in the uh, late 80s and and I read this first paper and it just blew me away I was like what this is how the brain works and and we can artificially simulate it in a computer and actually make it do something helpful meaningful and I've been I've been fascinated by that and uh, and I've pursued this for a long time and uh, the first realization about neural networks that I had, was that, hey, it's actually math. It's really statistics and ma mathematical models that you optimize uh, a big equation and then you, you, you come up with a 
with um, with a solution for that you can then use it for prediction so for the longest time people had been doing statistical predictions since you know since data ever existed in the 50s and stuff but but now there was a different way of looking at it you didn't always have to have an explanation you can have a black box that does certain things for you you just provide it input and output and and it trains a model for you that is uh, it works really well and uh and so i was just like that black box concept feels like the brain and it's just been fascinating throughout my life is there anything about ai that scares you i think with this recent generative AI spade. Like one of the things that I worry about is all this disinformation and this deep fakes and um, cloning of real people's voices to say something that they never said. That stuff is is scary. And, and we just have to take everything with a grain of salt now. You know, I, I think that's the, that's the one thing that I scare, I'm scared about. But I think, I think humans are Whenever we get scared, we identify a problem, that is, gives us the impetus to identify the solution as well. So we're coming up with solutions. The uh, scientists and the technologists are coming up with great solutions to identify deep fake, identify um, you know, misinformation, things that are blatantly false. So I, I, I think we'll have, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. But that's the one thing I'm scared about, but I think we'll have solutions. I think we have to be hopeful about this. But I also feel like if someone can come up with a solution to a deep fake, then someone else can come up with a solution to have something that's more deep than a deep fake or whatever the correct terminology would be. It, it feels like a never ending battle. How, so how can we remain hopeful? I think it's, it's true of anything. I mean, We've had cryptography people trying to, um, you know, break into into computers and hackers uh, or all, all kinds of things. We've this is a cat and mouse game, and it's been like this forever. And and uh, there will be people who have malintentions, and uh, and there will be people who have um, who, who who try to solve that. And I think I, I think human ingenuity is 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 the the reason for hope. Really? Because I feel like humans are the reason why we shouldn't be hopeful. <laughs> the half the half empty and the half full. I've traveled to over 40 countries and I've met I can't tell you thousands of people. And I feel like the vast majority of them are afraid of the future and they're afraid of each other. And maybe that colors my my half glass full or empty kind of uh, mentality. I I hear you. Although to some degree we're wired to be scared, to be fearful. Um, when our ancestors were in the savanna, and there's there's always animals that that were about to jump off and chase us. So. It's a survival thing. We were always wired to be fearful, and uh, and I, I think hope is actually the evolution that <laughs> that, that that helped us get out of there, and uh, uh, and it helps us escape every day. What's been one of the hardest things about AI for you? The, the, because I've been working in this field for so long, uh, there have been different hard problems at different phases. Um, I think one of the hardest thing when about five, seven years ago, when deep learning came out, when you had like these really detailed models with a lot of parameters that you can start, um, you could start to train on the explainability of it. Why chat GPT something it does something or responds with something. The why of it is, is kind of the one that really intrigues me. And, and it's really the hardest thing to get my arm around is like, okay, why does it work? Why, um, why does this image generate this way? Or why does it recognize this to be this object? And it's really like, it's really hard to explain 
with AI models because there's so many parameters, so many deep things that are happening. That um, So the amount of data is obviously a hard thing because to train these models have taken enormous amount of data. So the com compute and the memory and all that stuff is hard. Um, but I think the harder thing, this, the meta thing for me is I can't explain why it works. It works. Which do you think the future of AI is more likely to occur? A few companies owning the vast majority of the power or a lot of open source or smaller companies in a more decentralized manner? I think it'll be a combination of both, just like it is today. Uh, it's There's some companies who created these... Uh, I mean, OpenAI created this with a lot of investment from Microsoft and, and, and all that stuff. But then pretty soon right after that, we had Facebook open source their LLM models, Llama and the like. And, uh, and there's a lot of innovation going on in, in, in open source models. And, and uh, um, so I, I feel it'll be, it'll be a combination of both the, uh, the startups and the open source community can move much faster because of the power of so many brains working on it. And the, and the big companies will also move fast because they have the investments and the people behind it. So it'll, it'll be both just like it's always been. I don't think there's any, um, there's been any time where it's just been one or the other. What do you think the next big breakthrough or use of AI is going to be? from what you can see? I I mean, we've already, we're already seeing many of these things and they're just gonna get better over time. I, I had, uh, I sat in a self-driving car in San Francisco uh, last week uh, for the first time and I was blown away. Like this is uh, in, in the city. It wasn't even like in the freeway where you have like, you know, much, much more defined driving patterns but in the city where you have like people crossing streets and uh, cars parked anywhere and speed bumps and it was handling all of those situations so well. And it was freaky to watch the steering like steer itself. And, and uh, um, but uh, I mean, that stuff is going to get better. It's going to be more available. Uh, there was an Uber driver I talked to. If he's like, "Is he? Are you scared of this self-driving cars?" And he said, "No, I want to buy one so I can have that working for me when when I'm sleeping." <laughs> like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's gonna be a driver. There is already a driver shortage, Uber shortage in most American cities. So this stuff is gonna help out uh, in in transportation. So I mean, some of this is already happening. Um, even this. Um, the, the stuff we're seeing with chat GPT and la large language models, um, they're getting better and better at different tasks. There's gonna be task specific things in AI that we'll see uh, at, uh, at my startup, we're doing video generation with AI and it keeps getting better and better. Um, and, and so that like anyone can create or edit videos uh, and that's gonna get um, there. So this, I feel like there's so many like different modalities, different uh, areas mm. of our life that AI will affect in the future. I was talking with a teenager the other day and they were talking about cars. They said something about when they have a car in the future. And I was like, you might not ever be allowed to drive because, or your kids may never be allowed to drive. It might be illegal for humans to drive one day. And that would be really interesting to see. The, the safety of these self-driving cars is amazing. The safety record. So let's extrapolate five years from now. I know you're talking about generative AI getting better, but do you think generative AI will be the topic for five more years? Or do you think we'll have another breakthrough? Because I know that there's you said that there's different sets of problems that have happened over time that have kind of created these plateaus in growth, right? Um, sometimes for 10 years or 15 years at a time. And obviously ChatGPT created or enabled this newest breakthrough. And in, in, I guess it's the way that they built the model and and therefore the generative AI became possible. Do you think 
we're just going to focus on that? Or are there any other kind of roadblocks to a, a massive change? Because generative AI seems massive now, but in a few years, maybe it won't anymore. Definitely not. Yeah. I mean, we already see the hype dying. So there's a famous graph called the hype cycle. Uh, Gartner invented it. Like, you know, you see something really hyping up and then, then you kind of start, it comes to this trough of disillusionment. And after that trough, you actually start seeing valuable things happening with that technology. So I feel like we're kind of just at the peak of the hype or we're just beyond that a little bit in generative AI. We're, we still haven't seen the trough yet. And then we'll start seeing a lot more valuable things coming out of that. And there'll be similar hype cycles for other technologies in the future. I can't predict this. I'm, I'm really not a futurist, but uh, there will be other fascinating things that we'll see in our lifetimes, John, and, and, uh, and we'll go like, oh my gosh, this is, this has so much potential. Fair enough. I, I try to be a futurist, but in the realm of AI, I struggle because I'm not, I'm not technical, right? All I can do is look at the technology and try to extrapolate, right? So for me, I know that quantum is something that people are really heavily investing in. So I feel like when you can put AI into a stable quantum system, like all bets are off. That That's really the bulk of what I can see right now. What that actually means for individual industries or specific things, I can't, I can't understand. I'm not able to extrapolate on, on that level. Um, but I do like to ask these questions because I don't know what people are thinking or feeling. And it's, it's cool to kind of see that. I actually just wrote a newsletter, published it today about which is better being a founder or a VC. And the reason why I wrote that is because I had interviewed someone earlier in this year who was an entrepreneur and then became a VC and then decided to go back to being an entrepreneur again. And so he learned something from both sides and he felt like being one enabled him to be better at the other. And then ultimately that being an entrepreneur was the thing he preferred. And part of my argument is being a VC is really interesting because as a founder, you're focused on one thing for a long period of time. But as a VC, you have thousands of companies coming to you every year and you get to see what trends are happening before they become a trend. And so I find that very fascinating. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really like to engage in this kind of thought. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work and every week we bring you a new guest and a new story and what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll take you back to the show now. Yeah, I, I, I really like that discussion. I mean, the founder versus VC, because I deal with a lot of VCs. Um, I have VCs who are investors in my company and, and I talk to VCs and, and, uh, and I, I was in fact thinking about this, like, yes, they do get exposed to a lot of, a um, lot of technology, but, but there is, there is this thrill of creating something, building something that, that they, they get to sit on the sidelines of that as opposed to being in the middle of it. And, uh, and, and it depends on how, what your personality is and what you really like. And I, I'm, I'm on the creator side. I love to create things. I used to think I like to create, but I find myself enjoying being more of an investor now because then I can help other people create without having to do the dirty work. <laughs> <laughs> and the hard work, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. So I'm able to look at those trends and go, okay, I'm going to invest in, in this industry. So for example, you're talking about the, this graph and you're talking about full hype. 
it would have been so easy for me to invest in a company that was really early that had a generative AI, generative AI idea. Chances are in a year or two, a lot of those companies are going to be dead. They're going to be acquired or they're going to die because they can't monetize or people don't want to use it anymore or there's someone that's cheaper. So there's going to be this massive consolidation of companies. And I would rather invest in companies that are providing services to those companies or to enterprise companies because those companies will still be here at the end of the trough of illusion. No, a trough of illusion. Delusion? Dis dis uh, disillusion. Disillusion. I mean, you could probably use yes. all three of those words. Yes. Trough of delu yes. delusion is probably a good one. Um, or the, yeah, the, the height of delusion. So I, I would rather invest in companies that serve those companies because they'll still be here and those companies will still be here. And then maybe in a year or two, when we're in the trough, the companies that remain will be the strongest ones. And they survived. And those are the ones that I think are investable. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great viewpoint. I think um, I'm, I'm, from, I'm, I'm from Seattle. So uh, Seattle made its living or its beginning by this phrase called mine the miners, because a lot of people were headed to Alaska for the, during the gold rush. And, mm. uh, and Seattle was the place where the, they'd buy supplies and, and uh, get their get their gear. And so a lot of Seattle grew during that phase. And so what you're talking about is just exactly that. It's, it's people who are empowering the miners who are going on the, on the gold rush. Uh, yeah. I AI think of it, I think of it like uh, Levi's jeans. Apparently they made more money than anyone else, just supplying them with clothes to go and pan. During the gold rush. Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like, yeah. can't, you know, they, they did a good job. Might as well, you know, take their idea. It, kind of like the um, the railroad, you know, creators, right? They're like, we want people to move around. We're not going to build towns. We're just going to build the opportunity for you to go and build new towns and send supplies back and forth between the developed areas and the non-developed areas. You do whatever you want with it. We're just going to make money from you every single time you want to do it. Yeah. Although like, I, I'm not sure I, I would completely... Um, the analogy of gold rush and AI rush is probably not, not adequate, not a, not a good analogy, but, but regardless, I think yeah. the, the point that you're trying to make is, is, you know, that the infrastructure, the providers, the people who can help these companies mm. um, are, are potentially going to survive. Yeah. I mean, the, the first like industry that I really focused on as an adult was the blockchain industry going back to 2015 and there were a ton of, you know, ICOs and other projects and there was massive hype around all of them and everyone wanted to get in because everyone thought they were going to make a bunch of money. If you look at it now, almost all of them are dead. But what I did was instead of making my own, I provided services to those companies that wanted to make their own. And I made money helping them do what they wanted to do, which is why now I'm trying to do the same thing, but in AI. Mm -hmm. it worked once surely it'll work again that's awesome good yeah so you've founded several companies in the past this is i believe your victory is your third or your fourth third yeah my third yeah your third which one has been the toughest so far and why again different companies different stages and uh and I mean, I'll try to draw analogies between the different companies and 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 share the the tough parts happen at different times. And uh, so, in my first company, we were the building part is a lot of fun. Getting your first customer is a lot of fun. Um, getting the first investor is often <laughs> a tough part because you know you haven't proven yourself not enough. So that's been, that's always been tough. So in the first time around getting an investor was tough. Second time around, I decided, Hey, I didn't want an investor. I want to bootstrap it. Uh, so, so we bootstrapped it for the first, you know, seven years. And, and then 
we got a lot of like inbound interest from VCs wanting to put put money um, and, and the different kind of VCs, they're growth equity type people. And, uh, and they come in later when the company is about four or five million in revenue. And, and, uh, and then they, then it, it becomes much easier. The conversation is inbound. And, and so, but the hard part there becomes scaling because once, once you take the VC money at that stage, then they expect you to scale. And, uh, and the hardest part in scaling is think of, think of your house. If you have a, a single story house, say a Rambler, and you want to add a second story to it, you first have to destroy the foundation. You have to create a new foundation before you can put the first story and the second story back up. And that can be gut wrenching for founders in, and, and by, by destroying the foundation, I mean like, you know, maybe the people you hired early on are not the right, that will help you scale the systems that you put in their place, the things that you, that worked for you while you built the first floor of the house don't work anymore when you, when you're about to add the second floor. So that's probably the hardest thing that, uh, that I've done uh, in any of these companies is, is parting ways with early people that you hired in the company. Um, and, uh, uh so I haven't encountered that with Pictory yet, but uh, um, but I'm again the lessons learned is like okay you find people who can scale, but every person has different scaling uh, limits and and scaling ranges. People who are good at zero to one million may not be good at the one to ten million, and people who are great at one to ten million won't get you from ten to a hundred. Makes sense. I've heard that before. How have you had to change yourself from the beginning of your journey until now? I think I, there was a lot more arrogance I had before that I had to turn into humility over time because, and it's really interesting because you think, you know, you've done it once the second time would be easier and the third time would be even easier, but it's never that way. Uh, Every product is different. Every market is different. Every time in the industry is different. So, so you're constantly having to evolve yourself, but I think the, the realization that it's all about having a learning mindset and growth mindset, uh, I've, I've had a lot more over the years and, and, and I feel like that, um, you know, that that's one big change I can, I can see in myself. What's something you have wanted to change, but you've struggled to do so, or you've avoided doing it? <laughs> That's a really good question. I, I don't have, a, I, I don't have a good answer. I think we all have things that we stick to and, and, and that we should, uh, we should, we should shed, we should change. Um, I, I would still f- say, I mean, I don't think I've completely rid myself of arrogance and, uh, and there's still a little ways to go. The thing that I've needed to change and haven't is I eat really fast and I eat everything on my plate, even if it means I'm really full at the end of it, which is not healthy. I, I, that's a good point too. I often go for seconds and I shouldn't. Mm. <laughs> good point. What do you enjoy the most? about running companies? I, I have to say working with people, whether it's customers, whether it's your team. Uh, I don't think I could build a solo business. That's just not me. Uh, I love working with smart people and, and just the ideas that people have. And, and I love, I, I love ideas. I just love ideas. And, and, and I love the ideas that different people can have and, and different people from different backgrounds can have it. And, and so interacting with, with smart people from different backgrounds is kind of, uh, that's, that's why I started this company this third time around because I didn't need to, but, but I really miss that working with people. I can feel that from you. Yeah. When you talk about it, you, you're smiling and you're, you're animated and you can see your hands moving. So you can tell it's real. 
what's something you wish you could change about VC? The whole VC community, the whole VC world? Or VC as Vikram Chalana? Uh, funny enough, no, not yourself. <laughs> the, the VC as a whole, as an industry. Yeah, I, I think... I've, and I've interacted with hundreds of VCs in, in my, uh, uh, my career. In my, uh, and one of the things I realize is they are very hype driven. They are very, um, I, I wish people were, were more different. They are all kind of operate in the same path. Um, and a lot of VCs, they'll be like, okay, everything is about generative AI. So every, we're all going to invest about gener in generative AI right now. So, so you get a lot of calls and, and then, um, and, and then that's kind of one of the things at, at another company that I was doing, which was a medical device company, I was trying to kind of get people to look at it in a certain way that hit their devices, medical devices have a different lifespan. They have a different, uh, um, you know, you can't apply a B2B SaaS formula to a medical device company, but uh, it's just like you're you're always kind of, and I mean, and possibly it works for them, right? Because that that's the that's the reason why people go this way is like you know, going after trends, going after the hype works, and and if they can invest in one out of ten and make that successful. Um, that that works but i if there's only one thing i would wish for vcs is take more risks take do something different i think all vcs should be forced to start a company before they're allowed to be investors because i think a lot of vcs who are just money people don't know what it's like to run a company and so it's hard for them to align themselves emotionally with us and so it's easier for them to be cutthroat. I think we have, uh, there's room for both. And I, 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 I've I, seen both kind of like operator VCs as well as VCs who are pure finance people, um, as well as VCs who are amazing salespeople. And so they're able to make connections because again, they, they haven't, their sales have come from, you know, selling to LPs and selling to all these other companies. So they have like amazing networks that you may not get as a founder. Uh, and you only get that as being a VC because that's the world you, you've lived in. And, uh, and then the, the VC who's, a, who's been a founder before, they, they have a really good perspective on, on the business and, and, uh, and can give you a lot of great business advice. Uh, but I see room for both. Do you have a care routine to take care of yourself so that you can have longevity in running these businesses without burning out? I, I'm all about balance in life. And, uh, and I have uh, my care routine is about 30 minutes of meditation every morning uh, and, and at least 40 to 50 minutes of some kind of exercise every day, uh, running, walking, um, doing something. And then, then keeping the weekends or at least one day of the weekend to myself and some and family and personal activities. And, and I love hiking here in Seattle. We have lots of great uh, uh, hikes and, um, you know, mountains that we can go to and water that we can kayak in. So I think that balance is really important uh, for all of us, not just entrepreneurs. For sure. I've been trying to slow down since I left the U S 15 years ago. And it's very hard because Americans have this mentality of time is money and you have to go, go, go. You always have to be doing something, but a lot of other countries, they just don't have that, that mentality and being American outside of America, people keep going, we're not in America anymore. You should adapt. It's like, yeah, but, how do you rewire that? And I struggled in China. I struggled in Vietnam. And now in Portugal, I feel like it, it's starting to be easier for me because the weather is always so beautiful. It only rains like 20 days out of the year. And like right now, 
it's like 22, 23 degrees Celsius. And there's like no clouds in the sky. So you have this beautiful breeze from the ocean and you have not a cloud in the sky and the air is clean and you just don't want to go inside. Like right now I'm inside and I am not happy about being inside. I'd rather be outside. Even if it means not working, I'd rather be outside. And I find myself working a lot less in Europe because I just want to enjoy like what's here. So I've started to pick up golf again and archery and things that I did in Asia when I had a moment to spare. And um, so that's really kind of the thing that I'm, I'm doing to balance myself out. I also meditate. I've been meditating for 19 years, meditate 35 minutes a day. And meditation is great. I also walk yesterday. I, I decided not to really work at all. And I ended up walking like four hours, walked about 20 kilometers, a little shy of 20 kilometers. It's a very long day. Long day. Do you, do you listen to music or podcasts or what, what's your walking routine like? It depends. Sometimes I just want to call people. Sometimes I'll listen to a podcast. Sometimes I don't want anything in my ears and I just want to listen to the birds or to the tourists squawking or, you know, listen to the buses drive by. It just depends on, on my mood at the moment. But yeah, I, I, I walk, I've already, I've already walked like 12 or 13,000 steps today. Right, yesterday I did about 26,000. Yeah, it's funny. I, I sent a screenshot to my friend and it showed that I had walked, uh, it was like 12 kilometers at the time. And she's like, wow, that's great for, for a week. You've done fantastic. I go, no, that was today. And she's like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, if you look for the entire week, I've done already close to 60. And she's like, what? Yeah, that's I like, yeah, I walk like 300 kilometers a month. My shoes only last like four or five months. Cause I burned through the, the souls. That's awesome. Love it. Yeah. So it's cool that you got a, a healthcare routine. Um, I've been to Seattle. I didn't really hike, but I went to Whidbey Island, which is gorgeous. So I, I had a little bit of Island time. Yeah. I was actually in Seattle in June for a friend's wedding. Oh, oh, that's and, a, and uh, this is, that's a nice time. This year, June was very nice. Uh, Yes. Generally, June is, is uh, unpredictable. Usually, July and August are beautiful, but uh, yeah. Mm. Global warming has been good for Seattle. <laughs> Fair enough. So, what's the most important thing you've learned in life so far? The importance of connections and community and how much that can make you happy. So, uh, I feel happiness comes from not just individual accomplishments, but from connections and a community that you built around you. 